Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is artist Daryl Banks. Daryl worked for DC Comics in the 1990s on a series called Green Lantern. Daryl, welcome to Comic Culture. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me, Terrence. Um, so we talked about Green Lantern, and you worked on uh, the comic at a time when the industry was, was reaching new heights, both uh, creatively and, and marketing-wise. Um, and I'm holding up uh, the Green Lantern character that you designed. Um, when you took over the series, it was a transition time between Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern that most of us grew up with, with Kyle Rayner, a character that you and Ron Mars uh, worked uh, and created. So can you tell us a little bit about that time and, and how you got the, the gig? Oh, well, it'd be my pleasure. You know, we've, we've got to think in terms of this was the, the mid-90s. It was the era of the gimmick. Uh, we had uh, image comics was on the rise. You had uh, foil covers and holograms and all types of bells and whistles. And it was a time where, you know, change was literally in the air. And so it was, uh, it was an idea to, to add some added life to the Green Lantern franchise uh, what had happened was the death of Superman really breathed a lot of life and a lot of titles only on a, on a limited basis. But the powers that be wanted to find a way that how could they increase sales and keep them <laughs> and keep them rising. So uh, they they came up with an idea of to, to do some some radical changes and uh, to 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 make sure that the the fans could connect so that it wasn't just a gimmick. And I feel that we accomplished that because it, I, it's a pleasure to know that Kyle Rayner is still, you know, in the in the Green Lantern scene even to this day here in 2016. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting. You you talk about the foil covers, you talk about the gimmicks, but beyond that, DC was really putting out some some fun books. I mean, I, I remember going to my local comic shop, Fourth World Comics, Smithtown, New York. If they want to send me free swag, they can. Um, <laughs> But uh, I remember going there every week, and I'd, I'd buy my stack of comics, and Green Lantern was on my, my list. And you took over the book at a time when it had just, uh, there was just this big t uh, crossover with the return of Superman, uh, which everyone was talking about. Sales of that book were through the roof. And then yes. you, a relatively unknown artist, take over. So, I mean, that's, that's got to be somewhat daunting. Absolutely. Very, very much so. Uh, the thing is, I had just started with the company, uh, just months before doing a fill-in work with Legion of Superheroes. And in the back of my head, I wanted to draw a Green Lantern, but I thought I'd have to be at the company a couple of years to really prove myself uh, in order to, to get that opportunity. And so I, I would mention this to, to my, uh, I believe, the editor on, on the Legion of Superheroes, and I guess word got back to the Green Lantern office that it was something that I was interested in doing. And uh, you know, one thing led to another, and when you mentioned daunting task, it certainly was. It certainly was to be able to to do something that hopefully had lasting effects, and also to be something just fun. I, I just I think about the comics that I grew up on, and being able to uh, participate in something that people could remember and enjoy. Before we dive back into Green Lantern, what were some of the comics that you were reading? What was, or who were the artists who inspired you? Gr well, growing up, I I was <laughs> I was actually more of a Marvel fan growing up. I mean, there was some DC work there, but uh, my as far as artistic influences, uh, when I was younger, especially, let's say, in elementary school, a huge fan of John Romita Sr. Uh, grew up on his work on Spider-Man and Daredevil and things of that nature. Um, and he remains an influence to this day. Uh, then there are artists such as Alan Davis. His, his work uh, is a huge influence on my work. And uh, George Perez and his attention to detail and uh, the sense of... I want to say epic scope. When I think of George Perez's work, I think of something really important is going on, you know, and he's the person that you want to have participate. He does have a, a knack for uh, making even the most mundane scenes seem as dramatic as uh, the death of Supergirl. Um, so it, that, that's a, a great talent. And uh, I guess when you, when you look at those artists that you're mentioning, they do have a variety of different styles, and they certainly differ from yours. Um, so as a creator, it's, it's interesting to, to hear what the influences are and, and how that sort of gels into what you do. Um, you got to work with a legendary inker when you were uh, on Green Lantern. So again, it's, yep. it's your first big shot uh, in the big leagues on a big character, big uh, uh, you know, tie-in, and you're paired up with, with Terry Austin. Uh, how does that come about? Well, and also I have to, uh, to uh, mention that I got a chance to work with Romeo Tango also, uh, who's 
you know, work with George Perez on Teen Titans was certainly monumental. Uh, it was a, also an honor to work with him as well. Uh, but with Terry, I remember even when I was, was younger and, 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 wow, in middle school, uh, during the John Byrne, Austin, Claremont uh, run on X-Men, I, I would see Terry's work, and it was just so different from the other anchors that were his contemporaries. And they were certainly great, but there was just something about his work that was always fascinating. And uh, to be able to, well, it was I, I remember it was a Saturday morning, and Ron Mars had told me he had a surprise for me. And it was it was coming by by way of FedEx, and what it was was a, it was a, a short story in the Green Lantern Core Quarterly. Uh, that that was the first time Terry had inked some of my pencils, but they they kept it quiet. They didn't tell me who was inking it, but they said I would I would like who it was. And I remember opening up the uh, the FedEx envelope and you know trying to keep from passing out. <laughs> it's kind of like no way, no way. You know that was fantastic, and fantastic. I want to talk about the design of the characters, but I, I do want to touch on. Uh, the role of an inker. A lot of people, thanks to Kevin Smith, think of the inker as the tracer. Um, <laughs> and the, the amazing thing is you, you talk about Romeo Tangal and you talk about Terry Austin, uh, but they've got completely different styles and they bring different things to your pencils. Um, so as a, as a penciler, when you're you know, working on something, your layouts, your, uh, your full pencils, uh, and you see the, the inked work, I mean, how does that add to what you've done? It, well, fortunately, you know, uh, artists such as Romeo and Terry, they're artists in their own right. They're not simply waiting for the next inking gig. They can do full-blown illustration on their own. So they're bringing not just inking per se, but they're bringing illustration and uh, their own uh, flavor, you could say, uh, to the work. And it's unique uh, in, in their own way. But, you know, like I said, working with Terry for years and years, buying... Uh, buying you know, some of my most favorite you know, comics that he had something to do with, being able to work with him, to this day, it's still something I consider just an amazing thing to be able to, to look back and reflect. And I, I'm still in contact with Terry because he's a, he's a toy maniac just like I am. So, you know, we still, we're still in contact even to this day. But um, there, I, I've worked with, with many talented anchors over the years throughout my career. I'm very fortunate to be able to say that. But... You know, really with Terry, I, I think if there was a Mount Rushmore for inkers, he would certainly be on there, you know. And so uh, it's, it's, it's an honor, a privilege, and all those things. So um, let's talk about the design of uh, the Green Lantern uniform that you designed for Kyle Rayner. This is a time when I guess DC's trying to say, well, we've got Jon Stewart, we have Hal Jordan, we have uh, Guy Gardner, we have all of these other space sectors. So everyone sort of has the same powers. Let's kind of make this a, a more unique character. So he's now the last Green Lantern. And you, uh, from what I understand, uh, designed the costume entirely yourself. Um, and again, I'll hold it up for those at home who they want to find this on eBay, I'm sure they could. But you designed the, uh, the, the, the costume and the mask, which we talked about in Charlotte. So um, when you were designing it, just what were your thoughts? Well, the, the Kyle Rayner costume was a little bit different than when I designed Parallax. Parallax, the only difference that we made was uh, originally he was going to have the Green Lantern symbol on his chest. And they said, well, you know, it would make sense that we remove that. And then later on, we added the cape. But with Kyle, he used the sum total of many different designs I submitted, and they chose aspects of various designs uh, and combined it together. Like, we like the mask from this one, the boots and gauntlet from that one, the symbol from that one, and the bodysuit from that one. And you know, then I resubmitted it with all those uh, elements uh, condensed into one design. Uh, as far as the, the mask, which is uh, in some circles considered controversial, I, I, as, as I understand it, they call it the crab mask uh, or something of that nature. Um, I was greatly influenced by the the, uh, the 70s version of Marvel's character Sunfire. It's a, a Japanese mutant superhero. And there was just something about the mask, t which to this day I can't e exactly explain why I like it. Just Have you ever looked at something and go, I like it and I don't know why? Well, that's I've always felt that about Sunfire's design. And there's something about his mask was so different, especially considering it was in the 70s. And I thought, you know, I want to design something that harkens to that. I think something about the... The, it's the undefined, undefined nose area. I don't know. I, 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 I wish I could be more specific. But, but yeah, there's, there was an influence there with, with that unique mask. And also, you know, it being the 90s, armor was the order of the day. Every, you know, everybody was armored. I think, I don't know, Captain America was probably totally armored at, at one point in time. 
So having a Green Lantern have armor actually made sense uh, as it added an added layer of protection as, you know, they not only dealt with ranged attacks, but, you know, once in a while we get into, you know, hand-to-hand combat. So it just made sense to, for him to have, you know, that added measure of protection. So I wanted to incorporate that into his design. And at that time, you, you did have one of the, uh, speaking of design, uh, the, the run is where Hal Jordan sort of uh, has a meltdown and decides to destroy essentially the Green Lantern Corps. And uh, your covers from that run are um, iconic. I mean, there's the one where we have Hal Jordan with his hands up with all the rings and the maniacal look on his face. <laughs> Uh, there's the, the one where we see Kyle uh, kind of bursting out of the lantern. Um, so when it comes to covers, is that another thing where it's sort of by committee or is it just something where, you know, you're just sketching and they're, they're getting them back and saying, let's go with it? No, actually, covers fall in a different category than interiors is that uh, there is, you know, obviously the editor of the book, but there was also a, a cover editor. So I had to work with, with two editors when it, came, when it came to, uh, to covers. And I, I think it's it's just very interesting and, and very flattering that to this day people really remember the issue uh, 49 with with Hal with all the rings. I just remember the instructions were pretty simple. It was we you know we're going to show Hal in a light that people aren't used to that he's you know borderline <laughs> insane and you know how can we you know how can we depict this? And by the way, it has to be very striking from a distance. I remember that instruction very clearly. It, it's something that if you saw it. You know, uh, when you walk into your comic shop and, and you see a wall of comics, you know, the, the goal was you had to have an image that was simple and striking with a sense of immediacy to it. And so uh, I thought, OK, well, how's this? And, you know, I submitted some some you know loose sketches. I think uh, maybe the original sketch, we were pulled back a little bit. And I think they said, well, let's zoom in just a little bit more. And then the rest was history. It's interesting. Uh, I spoke with Jim Steranko uh, at Dragon Con in Atlanta, and he was talking about uh, his black and white cover for uh, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., and how Stan mm -hmm. Lee was telling him that he wanted color and he wanted it to be bright, and his explanation was, well, all of the other covers are colorful. Let's do a black and white one, and that'll stand out from the newsstand. So I guess it kind of goes to that iconic image now right, of right. Hal Jordan. Um, so what was the backlash like? I mean, you, you take a character who is beloved in the world of comics that eventually Ryan Reynolds would ruin, I mean, uh, portray in, in the film. Um, <laughs> So, so what was the backlash at the time? Uh, we've got this new Green Lantern, and uh, you know, DC's all in at this point. There's no uh, even thought like there was when Superman was killed that he wasn't coming back. But with Green Lantern, it seemed like this is pretty definitive, at least for the, the time being. I remember the most backlash, uh, believe it or not, was not introducing Kyle. Uh, to a degree, it was Hal becoming Parallax, but really, with a lot of the letters came in, was the death of Alex, uh, Kyle Rayner's girlfriend, and the whole refrigerator uh, uh, controversy. And uh, there might still be some fans out there that may not be aware of this, but uh, that scene played out a little bit different than how I uh, originally had drawn it. Uh, yes, she was certainly dead, but when I first had drawn it, the, the refrigerator door was actually open. And yes, she was, she was dead, but the, all the shelves had been smashed and her body was intact in there. Well, somebody somewhere thought, oh, we can't show that, so let's, you know, let's censor it. And so they had, uh, uh, like, a door added. I don't, I don't remember if I drew that or someone in production did, so that it looks like the door was mainly closed and you could only see partially in there. And, of course, most people think, well, who can fit a body in their refrigerator? So, so simply put, it looks like she's chopped up and not intact. So that made it more, in an attempt to, to censor it, it made it more horrific. And so I think a scene that probably would have been forgotten just maybe months later is now still a topic of conversation even, even to this day because of a simple, uh, let's say, mistake in censorship. Um, but, yeah, that was a, that was a thing where we, there was a lot of letters. And I found that surprising because Alex was not an established character. She didn't have a lot of history. Um, really, uh, to be honest, Kyle Rayner was really in, heavily influenced by Peter Parker. I don't know if that's if it was obvious, but he he simply was, and so Alex was Uncle Ben. You know, it was uh, just like Uncle Ben uh, really showed Peter Parker, I've got to take this seriously, great power, great responsibility, et cetera. Well, that was Alex's role for Kyle to to go from oh he's just this fun loving California kid just having fun with this ring to okay I, I've got to 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 really be responsible with this 
this newfound ability that I have. It is interesting because we still hear about uh, girlfriends and refrigerators as the, the trope, and I think Gail Simone, right. uh has written about it uh, quite a bit. Um, it, it's interesting, uh, too, um, when we see what's happening now with, uh, with Chelsea Kane and uh, the, her Twitter controversy, that there's still this, this issue of, of um, uh, the role of women in comics, and, and people look at it in such a negative light. Um, but I guess that's a topic for another time. Um, so uh, we, we have uh, this, this character who's now uh, stepping into being uh, Green Lantern. And the story is, I guess it was, it was Major Force, was that the character? Yes, that killed her, yes. yes. That killed Alex. And, and now we, we see a more uh, serious approach to Kyle. And yet the book itself still remained uh, fun, even though there was this tragedy. And this was a death that, unlike a lot of comic deaths, uh, seemed to stick. Uh, and was that something that was, you know, sort of set in stone? Like this is, without this motivation, the character falls apart. I, I don't, I don't think there was necessarily a, a rule put in place. A, a lot of things with with Kyle Rayner was, we we wanted to to breathe new life into into the Green Lantern franchise. I mean, let's be honest. For a while there, as, as well as as uh, Hal Jordan was developed as a character, just the fans weren't connecting for some reason. I I, I like to think of it this way. Kyle Rayner is you and I, an average person, uh, an ordinary person that that could come into all this great cosmic ability. Hal Jordan is the is the character you want to be. He's the fearless, like the astronaut, the test pilot, you know, the Chuck Yeager of superheroes. You know, he's like a Captain America. He's someone that you look look up to, but that's not you. You know, you you admire, you venerate, but that's not you. And I think with Kyle, it feels like we wanted to give the feeling of if you had the power ring, what would you do with it? What would that What would that be like? How would your life be affected? And uh, I think that's part of the charm. And also, we wanted Kyle to feel like a comic fan. Uh, when when you see uh, pictures of his apartment, you know he's got uh, books and 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 toys on on shelves, that sort of thing. And, and also him being an artist. A lot of people think that was my idea. Actually, it wasn't. It was one of those things that was presented to me. And of course, <laughs> I love the concept. But no, actually, that wasn't my idea. Uh, and uh, it was great working with, with Ron, who was a writer, but he thinks very artistically. He thinks very visually. And I, I think that's why we made a really good team. And I think that helped add to the longevity of Kyle Rayner. So um, speaking of, of Ron, now, when the two of you are working together, is this something where you, you've got, uh, you know, you're on the phone, you're talking about what the story is going to be like? Uh, is it something where he's presenting you with the full script? Or is this something where, um, you know, you go into the DC offices and, the editor's there and you just sort of uh, talk about what the next year is going to be like and he gives you an outline and you just go from there. Ron and I, we were at the time, we would, we would bounce ideas a lot and actually it was a thing where he didn't have to. I mean, the, the general uh, rule of thumb is the writer writes it and the, the editor approves it and the artist gets the, the, the facts or the, or the FedEx package and, and draws it. But Ron was curious what I thought about certain things because he knew that if, if I could get in, excited about a particular concept, I would put that added measure uh, to whatever I was drawing, which of course would make the story seem better. And it, it, of course, it helped him look even better also. So it, that was a very, very strong symbiotic relationship that we had. And uh, it kind of spoiled me because it was very unique. I mean, it's very uh, unusual for me to work with, with writers that uh, really want my input. Uh, I had that uh, working with uh, writer Mark Ellis on various uh, uh, project, comic projects in the early part of my career. But with Ron, I think also it helps that he knows a lot of artists, as, as, you know, as well as other writers. But, I mean, when he's around people like Bernie Wrightson, Jim Starlin, uh, and, and you know, people like that, it's, it's going to influence you know, how he writes because he's thinking, I'm going to write this, but how is this going to look? You know, and I, I really appreciate it. And I really I thought that we, we brought the best out of each other uh, during our run uh, on, the, on the title. Uh, it's also interesting, I was just thinking about um, the fact that you had, uh, um, I guess Kyle's biggest nemesis was Fatality. I was thinking, uh, once again, just like we were inspired by, by Spider-Man, Fatality was, was greatly inspired by uh, uh, the character Angela. Uh, the the editor was thinking, well, Spawn has Angela. You know, Green Lantern could use a, a Green Lantern hunter. So, uh, actually, they they left her creation more up to me, and Ron fleshed her out. I thought, well, we don't have uh, 
you know, we, we haven't had a character quite like her. Uh, can we, can I play around with the design? You know, I wanted to, to be a black character because I couldn't think of too many black female uh, super villains. As a matter of fact, at the time, I couldn't think of any. And uh, she has the history with Jon Stewart, and th they love the idea. The only I remember the only design change I had to, to, to make was her ears had to be pointed because the, the aliens from Planet Zanshi uh, had pointed ears, which I had forgotten. So uh, the, the design was pretty much straightforward. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, that was a character that I felt uh, well, actually, as I understand it, she became a, a star sapphire, I believe, uh, okay. in, in more modern times. But you know, it's good that that, that character also has, uh, you know, has a, a little bit of a following as well. But it, it is interesting when when a character, a male character, has a female antagonist, because normally it's you know Superman and Lex Luthor, Batman and the Joker, right. and and if it's uh, if it's a female character, immediately she must be the unrequited love interest or something like that. <laughs> so it was it was nice to see that there was uh, a little bit of progress on that uh, end as well to to see a, a new approach and and to keep it. Uh, a new and fresh approach. Um, now, in recent years, I guess you've been doing uh, a lot of teaching. Um, from what I understand, you, you've been working uh, uh, teaching cartooning and illustration. No, actually, no. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm more of a, a concept artist, uh, commercial illustration. Now, I did teach. I taught from uh, 1994 to about 1998. Uh, at the Columbus College of Art and Design, which is the, the school that I graduated from. Uh, I taught illustration, and I created a comic book class. And uh, the comic book course actually still exists to this day, uh, taught by a good friend of mine, Yuko Smith. Uh, the, uh, the class, even though it was, it was a comic class, but I didn't stress superheroes or anything of that nature, it was more like I wanted to, to show the comic storytelling process that could be applied to a variety of genres. Uh, it's interesting uh, that you say that. I've been uh, reading a lot of the DC Star Trek comics um, in the recent days. I came across a, a box at a secondhand store. And okay. they are, uh, unlike a superhero comic where there's action action, it's more cerebral. So you've got page after page of people sitting down and chatting. Um, so it's interesting that you can use the same medium and tell all these different stories and still oh, have absolutely. them be engaging and fascinating. Um, and what is it today that you would be reading uh, if you went to the local comic shop? Hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't collect it nearly as much as I used to. I mean, sometimes I like to check in on artists I really like more than stories because I just, uh, I don't know, I used to be big into video games and, you know, I'd be at the comic shop once a week and I have done neither, uh, just with, uh, you know, with my work schedule and, and the family and all that sort of thing. But, uh, online I'll read, uh, some Japanese manga here and there. Uh, there's one character by the name of One Punch Man. I kind of enjoy that, uh, and even that. There's many chapters I haven't <laughs> haven't caught up on, but uh, when I get that extra time, I'll be able <laughs> to do these type of things. But there's there's a lot of, of characters that are coming around today, uh, even in American comics that I think are are very interesting. And I think the the movies and the, the television are really helping things as well. It's true. Big fan of the Flash TV show, by the way. <laughs> uh, I've big fan of Supergirl myself. I really like how they, oh, um, me too. how DC seems to be, basically that's the only reason why the CW is still on the air. <laughs> <laughs> they saved it. <laughs> they did. Um, now you created uh, the visual look of Parallax. Um, yes, and, and that name also. And the name, and so as the, the creator of, uh, of this persona, uh, when you see the character um, change so that they can, I guess, keep the name and keep the, uh, the concept alive, but change the, the uh, I guess in the movie they sort of made it seem like it was um, uh, a spirit that would inhabit people. Uh, when you right. see your work up on the big screen, but it's not quite your work, how does that make you uh, feel as, a, as the creator, seeing that people are kind of taking what you left and, and tinkering with it? Ron Mars had said it best. He said, when you're doing work for a, a company like DC or Marvel Comics, you've got to think of it like not so much like owning a car but leasing it. You know, you've got to get it, give it back because it doesn't belong to you. I mean, even though uh, it's, you know, the concepts that I contributed to, I still, they're not mine. You know, they're, it's, it's their call to do, do with it whatever they choose. Um, with, uh, now, with the movie uh, version of Parallax, that sort of uh, harkens to the work of Jeff, Jeff Johns and what uh, his take on the Parallax uh, concept was, which is more of an entity. And uh, he did a great job with it. The only thing is, one thing I liked about when, when Ron and I were, were doing the Parallax story was 
we wanted to show that it, it, this was Hal Jordan's mistake. It was he was pushed too far, and what happens when even a superhero can be pushed too far and do something they regret? So to me, when you make it an entity, it's almost like you know, like kind of like the devil made me do it more than you know taking responsibility for something uh, that even a hero uh, isn't perfect. But you know, it was a different take. I, I don't think one version is better than the other. I just think uh, you know, Ron and I had a particular story we wanted to tell with Hal. And Jeff John certainly had his, and and uh, uh, history has proven uh, they were both successful, especially with 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 Jeff John's has done. Uh, the movie uh, that was a little bit different, but uh, <laughs> we'll do a movie review at some other time. But uh, but yeah, like I said, I, I really felt that uh, I liked the concept that it was Hal just simply being pushed too far, and it was something that uh, we wanted to address. The the, the goal initially was. After all the the parallax storyline, we were going to bring it all full circle, uh, return Hal to as being Green Lantern and restore the the, the Green Lantern Corps and all that, but it's like it became bigger than uh, than the creative uh, team on the book and the company itself thought. Oh, this is a nice new toy. Let's see what we can do with it. And then we had the final night storyline where where Hal uh, dies trying to reignite the sun, and people were thinking, "Oh, you killed up Hal!" Like that wasn't us. That was the the company was was so thrilled and what was that there was new life breathed in the title, that it was out of our hands, so. Well, I think we have about a minute or so left. I just wanted to talk, we had met at Heroes Con in Charlotte, and I just wanted uh -huh. to find out uh, your thought of the different cons. I know you do a lot of uh, convention sketches there, so I just wanted to, as a pro, uh, how you feel about going to the various cons. Oh, I enjoy them, very much so. I, I love uh, meeting the fans, signing books, doing commissions. Uh, my next convention is here in Ohio, the Akron Comic Con, uh, November 5th and 6th. But uh, I certainly look forward to doing Heroes again because this year was my first year there and everything I heard about it was true. It was a great experience and I look forward to doing it again. And if uh, somebody watching wanted to find out how to get a commission from you, how could they contact you? Oh, well, I'm, I'm on Twitter, at Real Bankster, and I'm also on Facebook, under uh, Daryl Banks. Well, thank you so much, Daryl, for joining us. We've run out of time. Uh, okay. I'd like to thank those of you watching. Uh, we'll see you again on another episode of Comic Culture.